Good morning, church family. Uh, it's so good to be together with you like this. And uh, I, I always look forward to the time that I get to spend with you in this way. Uh, I, I love you. I pray for you. And uh, it's just not the two of us meeting together or however many is in your home right now. It's really our time to meet together with a living God, to, to open his word and to hear from the living God. Uh, a fellow by the name of David Platt in his book entitled Radical Together, he has this statement. He says this, at all time, you and I have his message to us in all its power, authority, clarity, and might. We don't have to work to come up with a word from God. We simply have to trust the word he has already given to us. When we do, the word of God will accomplish the work of God among his people. It forms and fulfills, motivates and mobilizes, equips and empowers, leads and directs the people of God in the church for the plan of God in the world. And I love that because it, it speaks to the fact that this is God's word for us. We don't have to come up with a word, it's here. All we have to do is open ourselves up to it. And over the last five weeks, this being the six, we have uh, been in a series together. We've, we are calling it Diving Deeper. And in this study, we've been diving down deep into the Word of God to discover the riches of the person of God, the character of God, the attributes of God. Uh, we began this series several weeks back, and we did so with an illustration about uh, a ship that was sunk in a hurricane off the coast of South Carolina. And as it sunk there in 1860s-ish, um, there was uh, over $400 million worth of gold that was buried at the bottom of the ocean. And for years and years, it, 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 it just lay there. And uh, at last, someone in the 1990s discovered a way to, uh, to bring up that gold. And we talked about the fact that how many times uh, we kind of stay at the surface in our faith. We really don't dive down deep to discover the riches of who God is. And so we, we've begun a series looking into Psalm 145. And in Psalm 145, we have just gone really slowly. We've taken our time and uh, we have unearthed true riches of who God is. This is a, a psalm that is written by the psalmist David. And so far, he's, he's uncovered 15 different characteristics of God, if you've been keeping track. And right now, I've decided to kind of do a quick recap of where we are so far. So in our first week, we learned that God is God. It all begins with him and it is all about him. He is the creator and king of everything that exists. There is no one and no thing above or beyond him. Yet as God, he is knowable, desiring a personal relationship with each of us. And, and we learned about how, how God is our God. I will extol you, my God and king, that knowable God. Week two came along and we learned that God is great and active from generation to generation. And we learned that, man, it's our responsibility to pass the baton of faith to future generations. In week three, we learned that his word and creation reveal that he is awesome, good, and righteous. In week four, we learned that God is eternal in his existence and unchanging in his nature. He is both gracious to give more than we deserve. And then in week five, we learned and merciful to withhold what we do deserve. Even when we are unfaithful, God remains slow to anger and abounding. Remember that word? Abounding in steadfast love. Because God is in complete control. Every moment of every day, humanity enjoys the divine gift of God being good to all. This is our God. Now, if you've been with us, we, we've only made it through nine verses so far. We've been memorizing them together. I want to encourage you to stay with it. It is such a rich blessing 
to rehearse these verses and to be, be reminding ourselves that God is this wonderfully great, awesome, gracious God that He is. So we've, we've been spending the last two weeks looking at verses 8 and 9. And, and we learn that God is, it, God is, God is unchanging, God is gracious, God is merciful, God is slow to anger, and that He is good to all. And so now we move in our study, we've asked the question, what do these verses tell us about God? Now we're going to answer the question, how should we respond to what these verses tell us about God? And uh, we want to get into that this morning. I'm going to give you three responses that we should have. The first response is, we should thank God. We should thank God. Look at verse 10. It says this, All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord. All of creation must give God praise and thanksgiving because you, you got to realize we have been created to bring glory to God. And one of the ways that we bring glory to God is when we thank Him for all that He has done and all that He is to us. Now, uh, as far as I can remember back, my parents taught me that I was to have good manners, I was to be respectful, they taught me very young that I was to say, yes, please, no, thank you, excuse me, and I am sorry. Those were just core values of our family as we grew up that I was taught these things to, to have good manners. And so as a parent, I began to want to do the same thing. Laurie and I, as we were raising our kids, hey, good manners is very important. You're gonna go further in life if you've got good manners. And so I, I remember teaching these things and one of our children, we had a birthday and they, the child they had all the friends over for, for the birthday. And, and she was opening up, I'll tell you, it's, it was a she on this occasion. Since I had three daughters, you don't know which one it was, but w one of them, she was opening up her, her presents. And uh, she was opening up a few, and it was great. She was grateful and whatnot. And all of a sudden, she opened one up, and she looked at it, and she said, I already have one just like it. She set it aside, and she went open the next present. And I'm cringing. I look over at Lori. Lori's cringing. We're thinking, oh my goodness, this is not what you do. And so I kind of pull her aside and I said, hey, hey, you, you got to be thankful. You got to say thank you. And she says, dad, I already have one. I said, it doesn't matter if you already have one. You need to show appreciation. And I'm like, this was a lesson that we had to teach over and over and over again. And I learned something during that time. I learned that you can fake being grateful because she came out of that meeting with me and she said, thank you. And she faked being grateful in that particular moment. And the truth is that we can fake being grateful to God. Um, the Bible is not talking about you and me having good manners. The Bible is not talking about, hey, we need to show good manners and so just thank God and it'll, it'll make him feel good. That, that's not what he's talking about. David, what David is speaking of is it's much deeper than that. He says this, when you and I fully understand that God is eternal, that God is unchanging, that God is gracious, He gives us more than we deserve, making us His children, that God is merciful, that He doesn't give us what we deserve. We deserve death and punishment. We looked at that last week. When, when we understand that God is patient, we keep failing over and over again. We don't trust Him. We sin, and He keeps on showing patience and long-suffering. That it is natural when we really get that, to out of that appreciation, that to overflow with gratitude and thanksgiving, a heart for not only who God is, but for what He has done in our lives. And it's not just giving lip service. It's a response of our heart when we understand, we've gone deep, we understand who God is. And this is a principle of thanksgiving that is not just given to us in the Old Testament. We see it in the New Testament as well. Matter of fact, Paul talks about it. I want to read to you from the Amplified Version this morning of 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Paul says this, in every situation, no matter what the circumstances, be thankful 
and continually give thanks to God for this, don't miss this, is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. In every situation, we are called to give thanks. Now, I remember early on in my ministry, Lori and I, we wanted to have children and children were not coming and we were dealing with this thing called infertility. And we were, it was a painful time. We were just really hurting all of our friends and family. They're all getting pregnant. They're all having kids and we weren't. And I remember in a, in a point where we were really low and we had a Thanksgiving service at our church. It was a, called a Thanksgiving praise service. And a part of the service, it was a nighttime service on a Sunday evening before Thanksgiving. And uh, it was asked by somebody up front, well, just share what you're grateful for. And oh my goodness, everybody was thankful for all these things that God was blessing them with and doing in their lives. And I got to sit there. I sat in the church. I remember I was about two thirds of the way back, maybe a little further. And I remember thinking, you know what? I got nothing. I don't have anything. And I thought all these people have all these things to be thankful for. I got families and oh, God's answering prayers and God's not answering my prayer. You ever feel like that? Do you feel like that this morning? It's not uncommon to feel like that. But what the Word is telling us is that, is that even in that moment, we have so much for which to be grateful that God's grace and His mercy, the important things, the eternal things, what God has done by inviting us into His family has given us so much more. Major Ian Thomas was a fellow who used to come to our church on every year for several years he came and he spoke here for a week at a time and I, I was a teenager at the time and I loved listening to him speak and he, he wrote a book and in this book, one of his books, he wrote this. If in any situation you are not prepared to give thanks, you are out of the will of God. Whoa, I want to read that again. If in any situation you're not prepared to give thanks, you are out of the will of God. Why? Because God's word tells us in every situation we are to give thanks. Now, I wish I could sit here before you this morning and tell you that I have this mastered. <laughs> I don't. But I do understand the calling that as you and I consider the work of God, we consider the character of God, the awesomeness of God, the grace and the mercy of God, one of the ways we must respond is we must respond to thank, by being thankful. Is what God has called us to do. So let's apply it, man. How does that work? In the midst of losing a loved one to death, in the midst of losing a relationship that we felt was so valuable and it's over, in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of a divorce, in the midst of conflict in marriages, in the midst of sheltering in place, in the midst of anything that we may be facing, our response to understanding who God is, is to be thankful. Let, let me ask you a little question this morning. I want you to be a little introspective. I want you to answer the question I'm going to put on, up on the screen right now. We just talked about our response is that we, to go, who God is, is that we should be thankful. We should thank God. But here's the question. Is my response to who God is a life of thanksgiving and praise? Is my response to all that God is, His grace and His mercy and His kindness and His love, is it a life of thanksgiving and praise? Some of us this morning may need to start by saying, no, it's not. 
And so we may begin by uttering a simple prayer that goes like this, God, help me because I'm not thankful. I, I, I'm not thankful during this time of the pandemic. I'm not thankful during this time with the, when the air quality stinks. I am not thankful. I, I, I'm just not thankful. I'm not thankful for your patience. I'm not thankful for your kindness and your goodness. I'm not, none of those things are overflowing with a heart of thank, thanks, thanksgiving or gratitude f- for who you are. And so God help me. This is important because, you know, when we are not impressed by all that God is, I'm telling you, our whole focus is on the wrong thing. God says our focus needs to be on Him. So now, let me bring us to our second point this morning, and it's this. Our second response should be that we should submit to God. We should submit to God first. We should thank God. Secondly, we should submit to God. Look at verse 10. All your works shall give thanks. Thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. The first response is thanksgiving. The second response is submission. Now you say, where do you get that? See that word? All your saints. Who are the saints? The saints are Christians, godly ones throughout Scripture. When you hear the term saints, those are the followers of God, followers of Christ. And he's saying to you and me, all of us, should, what I say, bless you. What's that word bless mean? The word there means to bow low, to submit ourselves. To who? To God and His Word. You and I are called to bless. Matter of fact, to bless God. This word bless is used four different times in Psalm 145. It's kind of important that we are to find ourselves in submission to God and into, in submission to God's Word. Once we understand who God is, that God is the Creator, that He is the Gracious One, He's the Merciful One, He's the One abounding in loving kindness, we are called to submit to Him, to bow before Him. It doesn't just stop with us praising Him. Hey, let's have a Thanksgiving service. It moves on to now I me and you, we choose to align our lives, to submit our lives to God and His Word, His Word and His will. Charles Spurgeon puts it this way, if we praise Jehovah because of His works around us, we must go on to bless Him, to submit to Him, to bless Him for His works within us. So let me ask you another question this morning. I'm going to put it up here on the screen. Our second response is we should submit to God. And here's the question. Is my response to who God is a life submitted to His Word and His will? Is my response to who God is a life that is submitted to His Word, what the Bible says, how do I live my life? and to His will for my life and putting it where my life is lived in obedience to Him. So here's the question this morning. In response to the goodness, the greatness, the righteousness, the graciousness and mercy of God, is your life submitted to God? Now, let me see if we can't apply this in in a good way. Living a life that is in submission to God may mean that you this morning recognize that you have a relationship with somebody else that has been fractured. There's been conflict between the two of you. Maybe you've said some things that you should have never said and they said some things that they should never have said. And there has been this continuation of this unreconciled, broken relationship. You're mad, they're mad. And God says in His Word, listen, before you come and worship me, hey, leave your, you leave your, your sacrifice, leave your offering at the altar. Hey, before you offer a sacrifice to God, go and get right with that other person first. And you say to me, well, you know what? They're 90% at fault. I'm only 10% at fault. I only responded to them. They started it. They're 90% wrong. Then here's what you need to do, my friends. 
You need to own 100% of your 10%. Own it. And get right. Apologize. Confess it to God. Seek to be reconciled with this person, with this group that you have been estranged from for, for days, weeks, months, maybe even years. Scripture says, and you say, well, you know, I've tried that and it doesn't work. Okay, if you've tried it and you've really gone and you've owned 100% of your 10% or whatever part you have, the Bible says then, then it says this, so far as depends upon you, be at peace with them. But you gotta, you gotta go. But some of you have not gone. And so living a life that is in submission to God and His will means that you today make a phone call. You today seek to start to make it right. There's others of you today, in order to live in submission to God's word and his will, have some behaviors in your life, some things that you're doing, some things you're thinking about, some things that you have, are acting upon that are sinful. And, and you're the only one that knows about them, maybe. Maybe others know, but probably maybe it's just you. And when you live in submission, because of how great God is, because of His goodness and His mercy and His graciousness, He doesn't give you what you deserve because you deserve death. You deserve eternal damnation in hell. But He doesn't. In grace, He's given you forgiveness and love and a, He abounds in, in love for you, makes you His child. You say, listen, I need to live my life in submission to His word and His will for me. And some of you guys have been walking away from this. You've, you, you've been not refusing, rejecting repentance. Living in submission to His Word means that you acknowledge your sin, you confess it, you repent, you walk away from it. And you, again, in a fresh way, submit to His will and His Word. Some of you this morning you need to apply this ver way knowing based upon who God is you need to obey him in an area that he is asking you to obey him I don't know what the area is but God's been prompting you to do something God, God's been prompting you to not be selfish maybe with your finances and to be more generous maybe God's been prompting you to not just think about your family and your people in your life, but to get outside and recognize that there's neighbors who are hurting right now during this shelter-in-place time. There's people who are struggling with depression. Maybe he's prompting you to go do something. Maybe it's to share your faith. Maybe it's to pray. But, but God is prompting you and you've been rejecting it. And as you realize who God is, that His greatness and goodness Today, you say, you know what? I'm going to respond obediently in submission to his prompting. And I'm going to leverage my life, my time, my talents, my treasure. I'm going to leverage these things for his glory. I'm going to do it because he's prompting me to do it. This is so significant for you and me to do. How do we respond we respond by being thankful and we respond secondly by submitting to God's word and his will in our lives. Which brings us to our third point this morning. The third response is this. We should share about God. We thank him, we submit to him, and we share about God. God has revealed himself to you and to me. Listen, don't miss this. Because we got to get outside of ourselves. We've got to share this with others. We need to reveal who God is, what, who God has revealed to us, to the world that is around us. You say, Rich, how do we do this? Look at verse 11. It says this, They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power. You shall speak and tell. You got to tell. So you got to speak. You, you and I must use our words to share with the world around us who God is, the riches of who God is. So I break this into three points. Here, the first one is, we, what do we speak about? We speak about the mission of God, the mission of God. 
the mission of God. Th four times in three verses, I want you to pay attention to them as I read them here in a, so in a second. David talks about the kingdom of God. W watch it. Watch for the, these words. It says this, they shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. There's our second time we see it. Your kingdom, third time, is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Now, what is the kingdom that we're to talk about? What is this kingdom? There's th when you see the word kingdom, there's three different ways the word kingdom is used in Scripture. One is a, a general kingdom that God is king over all creation, all that He has made. Everything that is, it happens in this world and in the universe is under His, his kingdomship, kingship. So, so there it is. Another way in the Scriptures, kingdom refers to a messianic kingdom where Christ will reign one day. Okay, there's a third kingdom, and this is the kingdom he's talking about here, that there is a time when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is King. He is Lord and Savior, and he is inviting us in this passage to share that God is King, to invite other people to recognize God is King, to, to bow their knee before him so that they too might lever leverage their time, talents, and treasure for His glory, for His uh, honor and glory. Listen, church, I want you to know this. This is so important. When you and I understand who God is, we share who He is and advance, expand the kingdom by sharing with other people who Jesus is, what He's done and who He is. Hessel Church is so much bigger, uh, the, the, the mission, I should say, the activity of God in the world is so much bigger than Hessel Church. God has invited us to join Him in the expansion of His kingdom globally so that we could engage every tribe and tongue and nation and people to bow their knee before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Now, a lot of people think, well, I thought mission is just kind of like we send money on to the other side of the world. I thought mission maybe was gathering here at Hessel Church and uh, getting as many people to come to church as possible. No, no, no. It is a time that you and I, we share. We're a part of the mission. We share who God is with the world around us. I put this up there several weeks back. I want to just remind you of it here. It, it's my firm belief that the local church exists to teach people about the king, to disciple them in kingdom living, and to launch them out to join in God's kingdom activity. That's why Hessel Church exists. That's why we exist, to teach people about the King, to disciple people in kingdom living and launch them. God is calling you and me to thank Him, to then submit to Him, and then to speak of Him, to share of Him. We share of His mission, of what He means to, to every person who's a sinner, that Jesus is King who died on the cross for sins and rose again. This is one of the reasons why I believe that the church is so weak today, is we're not sharing this mission. And, and so we sit there kind of in an apathetic way. When I was in junior high, I had a friend, and uh, I, I tell you, it was such a he, was a, he was the cool guy on campus. He was the guy that was the best athlete in our school. And uh, he... Uh, I was a, I was a friend of mine. I was not nearly as cool as him, but he was my friend. And God started laying on my heart to expand the kingdom, to tell Tom about Jesus. And I was kind of scared because he was cool, much cooler than me. And I thought, but I could feel it inside of my spirit. And I was scared. And I, I, I prepared a long time and I prayed a long, I was, I was in junior high, remember this. And I had this little track, a little a piece of paper that could lead him through the gospel. And I, I met with him and I read through this little track and I, at the end of this thing, and I shared with him how he too could join, be a part of the kingdom, 
to, could trust Christ, believe that Jesus died and rose again. And Tom, at the end of this, afterwards, I, I said, Tom, what do you think? And he says, I want that. I almost fell over because he was so cool. And he said, I want this. I want to be forgiven of my sins. And I prayed with him on a school play yard on a Saturday afternoon, just the two of us there. And I remember playing basketball before and afterwards, and I had so much joy in my heart. Afterwards, I got on my bike and I rode over to my youth pastor house. I was riding as fast as I could because I was so excited that someone had heard and received the gospel. Listen, you're missing out on the blessing that is yours and mine because we're not sharing the mission of God. Yes, it's scary, but listen, it's not rocket science. We simply share that, that Jesus died for sins and rose from the grave. And all a person needs to do is admit they're a sinner, believe that Jesus died and rose, and commit their lives to him. That's it. Now, I wish I could tell you every time I've shared the gospel that people get saved like Tom. By the way, Tom is still walking with Jesus today. I lost contact with him, got back in contact with him via uh, the Facebook, and he is still, became an elder in his church, and, and he's still walking with Jesus. Isn't that great? But a few weeks back, I, I shared with you about another person in my life, my neighbor, who when he moved in next to me, took, found out I was a a, a pastor and he says never share don't ever invite me to church I don't I don't want to hear about your God and I don't want to go to your church but I was still his friend he's lived next to us for probably close to a decade I don't know and a few weeks back I, I learned through his wife that he had cancer his wife said hey he wants you to come over and I went over to his house and for an hour and a half I shared and at the end I shared the gospel as clearly as I could and he said to me, I wish I could believe that. I just can't believe. I can't believe. I said, what can't you believe? That Jesus lived? No. I can't believe that God would die on the cross for my sins, he said. I said, will you get it? Because that's what's happened. I asked him, could I, can I pray with you? He said, no. I don't want you to pray for me. I don't believe and I walked out of his house and I went back and I was sad. Two days later, I was told by his wife that he passed away. To my knowledge, he never received the gift of salvation. I'm responsible for being faithful. You're responsible for being faithful. Sometimes the stories end like Tom and sometimes they end like my neighbor. But we're just called to be faithful. And when you're faithful, you will feel the joy and energy of the Spirit in your life by just being faithful to the calling of sharing the mission of God. The second sub-point under the sharing is not only do we share the mission of God, but we also need to share the might of God. The might of God. In verse 11 we read, They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power or of your might. And then verse 12, it says, to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds. Not only does God possess power, but God does powerful things. God saves us from our sins. God shows grace and he's merciful and we must share of his might. But it even goes beyond that, doesn't it? Our God is alive and well, and He is daily working in your life and in my life. We get to share that the, our God is active and alive. He is powerful. Now, let me ask you a question this morning. It's a question I want you to puzzle over. When was the last time you began a, a, a conversation this way? You're talking with your friend and you begin a conversation this way. Let me tell you about what God had just did in my life. When was the last time you began a conversation? Let, let me tell you what God has done in my life. Think back over the last days or weeks or months. Has that ever been the case? 
But you tell that God is working because he is working. He gives you strength and peace during the pandemic. He gives you love for people that are not lovable many times, are they? And God, when you understand how great God is, he, it makes you want to share with other people about the grace and the mercy and the love that is, he's given to you. You just stand back and go, wow. I remember we adopted our son, David, uh, when he was three years old and, and uh, he came into our, our family. And I remember the first time I ever took him out, to, he wanted to go with me and I was playing basketball. And I, I took him with me and we were playing basketball at a church. Santa Rosa Bible Church had an open gym night and, and on Monday nights he used to go over there. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll bring you over there. And he got to sit there in the stands and watch me play. I remember the first time he ever saw me dunk a basketball. I, I dunked, I, 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 I don't ask me to do that today because I'm 60 and I can't do that anymore. Yeah, you'd be lucky to slide a piece of paper underneath my jumping ability now. But then I dunked and I, I just, I, I saw him out of the corner of my eye. I looked over at him at this particular point and his face was like this. And it was like, wow, my dad can do anything, right? Oh, that we as a church could have that expression on our faces. Oh, my God can do anything. That expression of a little kid. Oh, my Father. My God can do anything. Let me tell you what my God is doing in my life. My God has saved me. My God is eternal. My God is unchanging. My God is going to walk me through this challenge that I'm facing. I don't just believe God is powerful. I share that God is powerful. All we can talk about is creation, but it's more than that. Do you know that our God is powerful? He listens to you when you pray. I have a question for you, another question. If God answered every prayer that you pray, how would the world be changed? I mean, would this world be changed at all? I mean, I, I refuse to be a guy who wastes his time praying for the weather and praying for food that God would bless it. If God is almighty and all-powerful, why, why are we not, not praying for God to do a great work in this world? We, we, there, there, we support a lot of missionaries. One of our, my favorite, we have, I have lots of favorite missionaries, but one of them is a fellow by the name of Hermos Shariat. A Muslim, grow, grew up as a Muslim Iranian, an atheist, found God, long story short, powerful testimony, powerful ministry, and he found the Lord. Anyway, today he has a ministry where he has seen tens of thousands of, of, of Iranians, Muslim Iranians come to faith in Christ. And his vision statement, I went and saw his work in, uh, it, he, he has a satellite ministry, broadcasting ministry that they broadcast into Iran. And they are seeing during this pandemic, just scores of people find Jesus. And he is convinced, you know, that God is going to save the nation of Iran. They're going to, they're going to join the, the, the expanding kingdom. They will bow their knees. And he's praying for that. And his team is praying for that every day. Now that's a prayer to our big, great God. We got to share it. We, we thank God for, his, for his, who he is. And then we, sh we, we share it with other people. We thank him. We submit to his word. And then we share it. How? We share his mission and then we share his might. The third thing is this. I'll do this quickly. The majesty of God. We share 
the majesty of God. Look at verse 12. The beauty of God just makes us awestruck. He says this, to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious, the glorious splendor of your kingdom. This king loves the world. This king died on the cross for the world and he welcomes people of every tribe, nation, color, language, economic status. He welcomes all people. It's, it's glorious. I'll tell you something. I, I've done a lot, hundreds and hundreds of weddings. And uh, there's that moment in a wedding that is kind of fun because it's about the time when the bride appears at the back of the, of the worship center or wherever the venue is. She, she appears and she's hanging on to her daddy's arm typically. And everybody stands and everybody in the whole place turns and they look to the back and they look at this bride. And during that time, when everybody's looking at the bride, I try to sneak a look. I, I move to the side a little bit and I look at the groom's face. And, and I look as he looks out at his bride in awe. He's just enraptured with her beauty. That she is going to be his wife. He is awestruck and he can't take his eyes off of her. Oh, church, that we would be so awestruck. Awestruck of our God that we can't take our eyes off Him. That every day we're in His Word, He's inviting us, He tells us that he, we will never fully understand His might, His character, His, his attributes, His person. We will never fully, but He invites us in to understand more, to enjoy His beauty, to be awestruck. So that during this time of the pandemic, when everybody else is looking at, this is just a mess. Our eyes are fixed on our God. Our eyes are fixed on Jesus. We can't take our eyes off of Him. Can't take our eyes off Him because He brings us hope. <laughs> I was thinking today about how long we have not been able to meet as we've typically been able to meet. I continue to meet with our supervisors and even um, uh, California senators and assemblymen. And I've been, for whatever reason, God has allowed me to have a position of influence in our county. And I'm just really grateful for that. I'm humbled by it. But I speak on behalf of all the pastors here quite frequently. And it's been frustrating because I know what is going on in our world right now. I've been watching um, what is taking place. A lot of depression. People who are really uh, very strong and many other times right now are going through a time of depression and we're trying to figure out why. Uh, obviously, the, the smoke doesn't help and the fires don't help and the pandemic shelter in place, but we're not living like life like we typically are. I came across a study that Boston University put out, Boston College, I'm sorry, put out. And they found that, that depression right now in our country is three times as high as it typically is. Matter of fact, after 9-11, the depression rate went up to 12.5% of our United States populace was depressed, clinically depressed. 12.5%. After 9-11. After Katrina, we were at 12%. The report that came out last week revealed that our current population is at 25%. Depression rate at 25%. One in four people in our church and in our community are struggling perhaps with depression. And, and, and rightly so, right? Right? because all this stuff is all messed up. But here's the, here's the challenge that we as a church must have. We've got to point him to Jesus. I've been trying to get the doors of our church open for several months now. 
Not for those of you that are concerned and, and feel like your health is compromised and you couldn't come, but I believe the church is the hope that this world is looking for. And the only place they're going to find it is church. We, but we can't disperse it and meet like we used to do. So here's the deal. Here's the praise, right? The church is not a building. The church is you. The church is me. And we get to bring the hope of Christ. We get to share. We get to share the absolute might of God, the majesty of God, the mission of God. You are commissioned to do this. And you say, well, Rich, I'm struggling myself. Hey, listen, I know good Christians who are struggling with this. I'm, gonna, I'm not, there's no shame in this. But let me tell you something. Let's, let's go back to where, what God, the, our third point is this. We should share about God. Let me ask you a question. Is your response, is my response to who God is a life that is speaking about Him to others? That's what we're called to. We've been commissioned to do that. Well, I go, you say to me, well, Rich, I'm struggling. Okay, you're struggling. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you where you're going to get your perspective. Get your eyes off of this world. Get your eyes off of the political turmoil. Turn off CNN, Fox News, CBS, NBC. Turn it off. And get your eyes on Jesus. There's an old hymn and uh, it's powerful. Many of you will, it will co come to mind immediately as I put it up here on the screen for you, but it's pretty good stuff. It's so true. It says this, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth a pandemic, political turmoil, riots, conflict, pandemics, infightings, then the things of earth, what's going to happen? They will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. If you're watching this morning and you've never accepted the free gift of salvation through Christ. Let me tell you, we've been talking about how do we respond to who God is. While these responses are good, they're really not for you yet. The most important response is for you to understand that there is something that separates you from God. You're here, God's here, and sin has separated you. And only Jesus can remove that. And it's only by his death on the cross that he could pay for your sins and take your the, what your consequences your punishment of sin upon himself and forgive you and so this morning i i just want you to encourage you right now to in in this moment just to say i believe that jesus is god i believe that he died i accept his gift of salvation through his death burial and resurrection and I entrust my life to Him. Just do that right now. It's all it, it, it takes. And then, now you're ready to respond as we've been talking about this morning. And church, if you've already done that, hey, let me encourage you again. You, let's respond to who God is by having hearts of thanksgiving, having hearts that are submitted to God's Word and His will, and by sharing this with other people. Turn our eyes upon Jesus and then he'll fill us up and we can speak boldly and share. That's your calling. That's your challenge. That's your commission. That is how we respond to God and his goodness. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. Thank you for this time. What a sweet time to again, to look into your word, to get the perspective that we need, uh, not only about how great you are, how you are eternal, that, that you're unchanging, that you're gracious and merciful and slow to anger, and that you're good to all, 
And Lord, now we respond. We want to respond today with hearts of gratitude. Today, by submitting ourselves to what you're prompting us to do, whatever that is. And Lord, I pray you'd bless your people today. Bless your church today as they act on your, your encouragement. And then, Lord, may we share it. May the church who cannot meet at 5060 Hessel Avenue today, <laughs> it's okay. The church is still alive and moving and serving and speaking and declaring and telling of your might, telling of your kingdom. And may we do so with boldness and grace. Bless each one today. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you for watching Hessel Online. Make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can stay up to date on the latest content and also share it with a friend. And if you've been blessed by our ministry and want to support us financially, you can give through our app or, or click on the link in the description below. I want to thank you again for watching and God bless you.